But my name is Eric Hempelman, and I'm the box cutter guy, and I'm hoping I'm in the right room. Is that what we're here for? Yes. I knew today was going to be a good day. <laughs> um, while we try to get some pictures pulled up and stuff, I'll do a little bio real quick. Uh, I've been doing it now since October 24th, 2013. The day that was an infamy for me. Um, best day ever, and one of the worst days ever. It's a, it's a fun career, but it definitely takes its toll because uh, physically it's pretty demanding stuff. So, if you guys are going to undertake a box cutter project yourself, good luck to you. Um, but it's definitely doable, and uh, I don't know how many people in here are here for that reason. Do we have anybody that's trying to like do it themselves on their house, or are we just... Cool, cool, yeah. Yeah, I figure you're a handy guy. <laughs> and uh, it's really not the hardest thing in the world, it's not possible. Um, a couple specialized tools and stuff, I'm sure you can probably can solder, stuff like that. But um, if you're not too handy um, and afraid of heights, call a professional. Specialist, we're around. Um, Definitely be careful who you call because there are guys that uh, you know might not know everything or even some of the bigger companies might have guys that come out and they're great guys but you know they're not experienced with boss gutters because they're kind of a specialty system, um, kind of a unique system uh, around this area and northeast, uh, kind of a dying trade. But um, we'll start out just kind of seeing what even box cutter is. I brought a little tiny sample in. It's uh, the trough at the bottom of your roof and it's just like a normal gutter. It's going to catch all the water. Uh, your Lowe's gutter, that's going to be like a six inch seamless that you get, you know, somebody runs it off at your house. It's a you know, little tiny thing and they're all custom sized box gutters. They all fit the framing of your house because the box gutter is just the extension of your house. It's the rafters themselves. It's uh, pitched to drain however it needs to and then it goes uh, wood, metal, solder, that's a box cutter. Uh, with that in mind, hi, I'm Eric. How's it going? Uh, I'd love to have some images and stuff, but patience, patience, patience. Draw pictures on the board over there. Ma'am, you do not want to see my artwork. <laughs> no, but um, around here, what you see a lot of the time is the boss cutters will have linings and stuff like that. Now, I'm not going to say, like, who all knows exactly what's up on your roof, because some of you might not even have a clue. You might have an old house and you don't know a lot about the boss cutters because you got to scale a 40 foot ladder or a 32 foot ladder. You don't know what's up there. The best thing to do is get some free estimates, whoever it is, get pictures, get familiar with the system that's on your house. Like I said, it's going to be something like that. Get an idea of kind of material, the kind of roof that you have, shingles, whatever it is. Because um, sometimes you get up there and it's not what you think it is. It'll be a rubber liner, it'll be some aluminum coil stock hiding all sorts of stuff. It could be repairs from chucking a truck that you don't know what they've done in the past and you don't know what it's you know hiding. Because uh, unfortunately, Northern Kentucky, you see a lot of it. Uh, Cincinnati area, you see a lot of it. You'll have three, four layers. Um, Sometimes people will just throw one layer of metal on top of another layer of metal. That's not how you fix a box cutter. And when you fix yours, don't do that, please. <laughs> you want to always go down to the wood framing. You're going to take it to the rafters, uh, depending on the wood repair that's needed. Because sometimes you'll get up there, you'll tap it with a little tiny six ounce hammer, and the whole thing will fall off. If it's been neglected, it's not unfamiliar. I mean, that happens. So, the best thing to do is catch it before it gets to that point. But you're going to take the liners off, you're going to take the rubber liners off, you're going to get down to the bare wood, and you're going to assess what you're looking at. It's going to be extensions, rafters from your house. You can either salvage them, or a lot of the times, and when we end up getting some pictures, we'll see, you have to sister new rafters onto them. You have to pitch those correctly to make it go left, right, whichever way, because you're going to have, you know, every house is unique. It's going to be a 45 foot stretch, it's going to be whatever it is. In a drain specific way because you might have a driveway on one side, you might have you know open yard and you don't want it to go to the driveway, it's got to go to the yard. Um, they might have huge segs in the middle. It's all going to be you know unique. You're going to have to prepare it to your <coughs> needs. Um, and if it's been neglected to the point where it's falling off like that, I guarantee it's going to be sagging in the middle or sagging somewhere where it shouldn't be sagging. So that's why, again, you got to get down to the bare wood. You have to repitch, 
run string lines, do whatever you got to do, put levels on it, and you're going to make it brand new wood with whatever kind of material you want to use. This is a kind of a newer, not really newer, but it's a steel product, which they don't have turn metal. A lot of these houses, the old tin roofs, the old uh, gutter systems that you see, they'll be like a old tin alloy. That's pretty old stuff. They don't even manufacture it anymore. You're gonna have to kind of do whatever we have these days. Stainless steel, we have galvanized steel, we have paint grip, Resibon. This is Resibon steel. It's pretty common. Um, it's one of your more economical uh, options. Um, you're gonna have to paint and maintain steel. Uh, it's not like copper where you don't ever have to touch it. And you know, once you solder it, if it's pitched right, if everything's taken care of, once it's installed, copper you don't have to touch. That's the best system, but it's going to be most expensive. Um, but that's why it's very important to know what your. Thank you, my friend. Is that all? Just touch screen. I took up there. Arrows. There you go. Neat. Uh, and if you need to write, you can click here. Don't even confuse me. Okay. Don't. <laughs> You're good. I'll buy it here later. You just saved my life. So hopefully we have some uh, pictures. <coughs> We've already kind of talked about some session description. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's get back to that one. That's a fun little project that we did over in Bellevue. Um, that's a flat lock copper 16 ounce roof. It's so much better with pictures. Um, it's a radius gutter. Now, that's kind of a rare thing. You're not going to see that on your average house. And if you have this on your house, don't, please don't do it. Um, there are a lot of ways to do those. You can cut small sections, and that's what you see a lot of the time. Is somebody will just make little one foot sections and they'll try to wrap it and it's a primitive thing and it works for a while but then you have 20, 25 places where it could leak where this is a 10 foot section and floss cutters are going to be done in 10 foot sections most likely uh, that's just the size of the brake the tool that bends the metal so you want to do as few seams as you can and that's why uh, if you have something like that you want to you know make it one flawless system this is actually what we call Pittsburgh lock, where um, this back piece is separate from the bottom, but it locks into it in a way that this is not only soldered, but even if it was a pinhole, if it's an average range on it, you're not going to get water behind it. But at the end of the day, it needs to be properly you know, all soldered. A few seams is better. Um, keep going with that. Like we said, common problems are going to be the sagging, uh, the seams busting. The seams bust is going to be the first indicator, and that's because of usually expansion contraction. Uh, if you have a 40 foot stretch and you have a bunch of different sections, and you know, we get, I don't know, negative 20 degree, I think we shed wind chills uh, when my fiance was helping me out on Christmas Eve on a roof. Yeah. We shot one snow, and we also get 100 and 18, 115 degrees summer. So we have a lot of expansion contraction in this region. Um, some metals are more susceptible than others. Hopper is going to move roughly an eighth of an inch of uh, 100 degree temperature change for a 10 foot section. That's significant. I mean, it is. That's why we'll get to it. Um, it needs to be engineered to your roof's custom needs as well. Sometimes you can, uh, and here we go with the failing seams, and this is one where I was on. You know, the neighbors are flick over, you glance over, and you just see a big smiley face. It's a happy day because the happy, you know, it's smiling at you. That's not right though. You know, you've got a downspout over here, and it wraps around the corner, there's a downspout over there. But you can see water lines coming through because it's sagging in the middle, and that's a big indication that you need new liners. Um, this was a separate roof, actually. I think that has a uh, liner on it, like an EPDM rubber liner, but usually those will be fascia wrapped. EBDM, um, that's like a good old fashioned flip and fix type thing. Somebody's not going to put the money in fixing it right. And you got to be careful about contractors that are just hiding the problem because they're still rotten wood, they're still sagging wood. They just covered it up with brand new shiny metal and it looks great for you know new installation, but the problem's still there. Uh, as far as the maintenance of box cutters goes, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory like we talked about. Uh, you're going to have to do uh, the painting of steel if it's not copper. Um, if you don't paint it, well, guess what happens? It's going to rust out. That's just nature. You have you know, oxidation and galvanic reaction. The galvanic reaction is going to be two separate metals touching each other. It's going to accelerate the oxidation and it's going to rust out. We'll kind of get to that in a little bit. Some pictures I'll show you where somebody didn't take the... Um, 
liners out. They just put metal over top, and what happens is it rusts where those two contact, and then rusts from the bottom up. So again, it might look fine, but if it's not done right, it's not fine, and we'll get to that. Um, one of the other big things is even if you have brand new box cutters on your house, you still got to maintain them. Uh, the downspouts are going to be huge, critical things you got to take care of because if you neglect that, you could have water build up and uh, all sorts of issues, and you could be confused. You could think that the issue is over here when you know it's actually not an issue. It's just backed up or something like that. So you just want to keep downspouts free and flowing clear. Uh, keep your box gutters free of any sort of uh, debris. Um, stuff like this is going to hold water and what's going to happen. Uh, these are copper over here. And this was my client. This was a neighbor and actually knocked on the door, jumped over and cleaned out the neighbor's for him because, you know, it was a eight foot or eight inch gap, you know, to step over, help out. Um, these weren't a problem because they're copper. Even if they hold some water, it's not going to be an issue. They have the natural oxidation layer that protects it, so you don't have to worry too much about copper rusting anything like that. It's not going to. These were not, and if that all gets wet and holds water, well, what makes rust happen? Water. It's going to accelerate that process, and what might be, and it's probably not even a thought for you because it's going to be 25, 30 years before brand new metal rust out. What's going to happen is that's going to rust out a lot faster than it would if it was free and clear, or if you know it wasn't painted, because that could last 50 years if it's you know clean, painted, taken care of. Um, so the big thing is just you know make sure, and as you can see, that one was just a downspout, and that was in the copper one. So even though you have copper, you still have some work to do. Uh, some strainers and stuff you can put in there later. We'll talk about, but. Um, if it is time for the upgrade, like uh, we kind of saw the picture, the big smiley face we talked about, uh, if it's beyond repair, if it's you know not just aesthetic, but there's big sag or rotten wood, whatever needs to happen, you're gonna know from getting up there, knowing what you're dealing with. That's where it's good to work with a contractor, or if you don't have the pictures, somebody that's transparent. You don't want somebody that got up there and it's just like, oh, it's pretty bad. You don't want to see it. It's gonna be ten thousand dollars. Just trust me. Uh, know what you're dealing with. Take care of you know due diligence, and uh, if it's a minor problem, you might not have to. But if you do, uh, if it's you know sagging or if it's rusted out, if there's a leak in your house or something like that, it might be time for the upgrade. And uh, like we talked about, that's going to be stripping down to uh, wood, getting all the metal out, showing bare studs, and there's going to be a bunch of pictures at the end. Um, you know, kind of go over. So I'll just rush through this, or at least attempt to. But. Um, here you can see those repairs we talked about where you have the liners. Um, this is something where they screwed a diverter on because the water was overflowing. You see that a lot. And that's kind of where I was saying you know, people might try to hide the problem. You had a contractor come in here where it's holding water here, not going to the drop tube, which is at the end. It's sagging. But some contractor didn't want to redo it. And the homeowner was like, hey, I got 300 bucks. Let's fix my box gutters. The guy came in. He screwed a piece of metal down, raised that lip up just in that one section. A little bit of caulk along that line, and it's out of sight, out of mind. It's not going to be overflowing into your driveway. It's not going to be, you know, something that you think about. But there's going to be a giant pool up there, and that pool in the winter, especially, is going to be weight. It's going to be a big problem, especially after, you know, let's say five, ten years even. I mean, that could last for a while. It's going to cause a lot more damage. Eventually, this is going to fall off your house, and this is one of those special ones where you get up there, tap it with that little tiny, tiny hammer, and the whole thing can fall off because. The rotten wood's covered up with liners, and all these fixes were done to avoid fixing the real problem, but just hide the problem. You never want to do that. It's never going to economically make sense because you're going to have $1,000, $1,500, $2,000 in wood repair if you have to you know, repair the entire thing. And that's why box cutters get a really bad rep because people come through, they do it wrong, and they have to redo it. And then after the third or fourth attempt of doing something, they're like, hey, let's just cut it off and put you know, a six inch cutter on there. Don't let it come to that. It can be done the right way the first time. That's the big thing, the first time. Uh, salvageable systems, we've kind of talked about that, where you know if it's not the end of the world, we need to just maintain it. But if it comes down to the relining, we uh, do the right material, we use the right flux, we need to solder it correctly, we gotta do the right rivets, get it down to the uh, wood, do any wood repair that's needed. That's one of the biggest, most important parts. And is often overlooked because if you have brand new metal in there and it's not done pitched correctly, what the heck did you spend the money for? You still have the issue. 
So, reline, it's going to be that sample over there. This is some Resibon. Um, these are some pictures of obviously you know, some in progress, and we have uh, some soldering going on here. What we do is we take all the custom measurements, take all the custom measurements. Uh, everyone's going to be a little different. These angles, they're going to be different. Some are 45 degree angles, some are 90, some are some, you know, Yankee systems. I'll show you later. They're uh, built up with a big water table on the front. Everything's going to be different. There's no slap it up there, one stop shop. You bend all the metal to the way that it needs to be, and then you go up there, you're going to clean this, and that's where, again, you can do all this stuff right. And it's a pretty easy process. Just make sure that you do it. Right, uh, do it right the first time because one misstep in any of this and you did the whole thing you know, for nothing because it's going to fail prematurely. If you don't clean this right, you're not going to get a very good solder joint. And if you don't get a good solder joint, it's going to leak. This Resibon steel and every material is a little different. Copper is going to be one of the easiest because you don't really have to clean it beforehand. But this steel has a factory finish on it that needs to be cleaned off before you put the flux on. and Kind of find that out through you know test trial play around in the shop a lot see what works best we found that to get this factory coating off of here acetone works very well as a residue cleaner and then we use the right flux which for this we might stay clean um, and then we use another one ruby fluid to clean the irons and stuff a bunch of different irons a lot of ways to do it you know every contractor is an expert and they're all you know just going to do it their way there are a lot of ways to do it but it needs to be done following the right guideline. There, you know, it's still a process. You got to clean it the right way and all that. But there's more than one way to do it. Um, after it's cleaned, what we're going to do is rivet it, and you'll see in uh, some pictures throughout uh, this the process of riveting them, where we put the two together. Whether it's a miter, where it comes to a 45 degree angle, you got to cut it and make sure that the fabrication is done very tight in it. Make sure that all your uh, metals riveted close together. If you have huge gaps when you're doing it, you're going to have issues, and that's why it's kind of a specialty thing. Um, your average company, if they just do six inch gutters from Lowe's, they might be decent guys with metal, but they might not do the wood repair as well. If they just do wood, they might not do the metal as well, and that's why box gutters are kind of a uh, specialty breed, I'll say, from back in the day, where if we started out as carpenters, because a lot of it is carpentry, and then we also had to learn you know, the metal work because it all ties hand in hand. But um, making sure that your metal is seamed right and that the 45s are tight is going to be a huge thing because then you're not just relying on the solder. You're going to have you know the rivets and everything holding it together. Uh, this was a pretty weird project. This is a new construction. This is an addition and I've put box cutters on maybe two houses that were brand new. You don't see that. But they matched the historic which had uh, the original house had box cutters, so that was awesome. Those clients ended up doing that. Uh, that was just a photo we're throwing in there. Um, won't be the conclusion. We have a lot to talk about with pictures and stuff. But um, every system being, you know, done right. Like I said, with copper, you're not going to be doing the cleaning as much as uh, the soldering is more important on the copper. You're going to be using a pine rosin flux. So you stay clean, but Copper is a pretty unique system because it depends on how you're going to do it. If you use too much heat, it's going to turn purple. If you use the wrong flux, it's going to turn green. And that's why going to an event like this, talk to me afterwards, especially if you're trying to do it, because I can kind of point you in the right direction. Or cork and steel supply, I mean, they're a really valuable tool as well. It's my pen and paper people write that down if you're here for a project, because they are the professionals that point you to the right materials as well. Um, it's all about the right flux, right stuff like that, right material. Um, but this is one that we had done uh, where we had some expansion joints and stuff, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, the expansion contraction is, like I said, one of the biggest enemies of box cutters. You're going to have natural forces fighting these seams. Uh, it's a big system. It's going to have a lot more energy kind of fighting at that one seam. And if it's not riveted right, if it's not held down properly, if it's not soldered right, that seam's going to bust. So, um, again, just a picture of your uh, steel liner. This is a stainless steel. Um, I'm not the biggest fan. I usually don't do stainless steel. It's a little bit more difficult to 
uh, solder, so material wise, or excuse me, labor wise, it's going to be a little bit more expensive, and material is. Um, at that point in time, I would highly recommend just going with copper, um, and it keeps that aluminum foil look for you know ever, which I'm not a big fan of. So, a lot of historic districts and stuff, which a lot of you are going to have houses in historic districts, you can't even do that, or you can't get away with it because it's going to be you know a shiny look, and we want to kind of match what was original and historic. But this was one project that uh, we had done. This was beforehand, and we did an expansion joint that we'll talk about uh, because this was a 50-foot stretch, maybe. Um, at that point in time, you're going to want to break it up because you got those horses fighting each other. Uh, little tweak, that eighth inch of motion that we talked about with the you know, snow and ice and everything, and that temperature swing, that eighth inch is enough to bust the seams. So. You just want to make sure that your gutter is engineered for your house. Um, and you can see, you know, this is that EPDM rubber liner. This is uh, stuff that had been repaired in the past. Uh, people had tried to patch it, never solved the problem. You can see uh, how many years it had been there just by the amount of rust that was on it. Um, don't let your gutters get to that. It's just going to cost you more money. Uh, this is after we had already torn it out. Um, you got, you know, just wood repair everywhere. And this is a very nice one for the most part. Some of them, this isn't one that fell off. This is a trough board, which is all pretty aesthetic. Uh, this trough board is the one that's at the very bottom there. It's like a one by, we just replaced that. You have to pitch that right. That's the critical one where you have shims underneath the rafters, or the rafters might be notched out themselves to uh, pitch it to the left, the right, whichever way you need to go. Almost every gutter is going to be like that if you have some sort of patch and that's not extensive wood repair that's what we would just my company we include that with uh, this because it's almost a given it's not going to be two by fours it's not going to be uh, the rafters uh, it's once you get to like the crown the fascia stuff like that and you start looking at extensive wood repair so if you open up your box gutter you see that not the end of the world um, this is that expansion joint that we had talked about and that was installed right in the middle of this roof. Uh, now the engineering of this system, I, mean, it's, I was in engineering school for like two months, guys. So I'm, I'm using big words here, and it sounds fancy. It was just what that roof needed, and that's what's gonna make it last the longest. So we engineered that one with an expansion joint um, to combat, or at least allow that expansion and contraction, because if that wasn't added, those seams would have busted in the middle of the corners. It would have had that extra force. What that did was it broke it up, and I'll show you a little bit um, some copper ones that we had done. And it's two separate gutter systems with an end cap on it, and then that allows the expansion contraction, just kind of allows it to do what it's got to do. Um, we'll get to some copper one. Here we go. Here's another expansion joint. Uh, I believe we'll get a look closer look to that where again it was broken up uh, you got a cap on top of it it's two separate gutters pitched to the left pitched to the right to meet the downspouts not every roof's going to be like this if you have a little 35 foot porch uh, on like a box gutter porch you don't need that don't worry about it those come into play with the material copper is going to expand a little bit more and contract a little bit more so it's more important to have it if it's like a 40 foot stretch is kind of when you start questioning it. Uh, 16 ounce versus 20 ounce, there's a lot of factors that go into it. 20 ounce isn't going to move as much. 16 ounce is going to be a little bit weaker, needs a little bit more support. Again, I mean, it's really not rocket science, guys, but there's a little bit that goes behind it. Um, so, again, expansion joint in the middle. Every roof's going to be a little bit different. And that was just kind of your common uh, porch that you'll see in this area. It's very common, you know, almost every house in Newport, Covington has these little porches, and uh, you just bounce around from one house to the next. And right now, I mean, we have about a year lined up of these little porches. So I won't say they're cookie cutter, but they're not, you know, every, every house is a little different. This is that water table I was talking about, the Yankee gutter. Um, this was one that was over in Newport, um, an old church that was getting converted into an event center, a pretty cool project. Um, this right here is a separate piece of metal than this up here. Um, so what we do is on this little box strip, on the 
front here. We hook that onto a piece of drip edge, and we don't nail the back of it, and that allows us to, we cut little tabs, and we put a tab on, we fold it down. That allows it to move in the back if it needs to. If it's a long stretch, we'll get to, you know, some systems that aren't like that in a minute. And that hook strip on the front just bends onto it. And that allows it to do whatever it's got to do on a very long stretch. Um, that right there is this right here. This came up as well, another piece of drip edge on the bottom, and a piece of drip edge right there, and it all, not today, buddy. <laughs> not today. Uh, it was all just separate systems, and like I said, what that's going to do is just going to prevent um, a lot of, you know, the temperature change, the snow and ice is going to sit up there, everything. It's going to reduce the amount of stress that are on the seams, and that's what this is all about. The seams stay well, and your boss cutters are going to do fine. And that's why sometimes you can do that. You don't want to nail them down all the time. Uh, if it's copper, again, we cleat them, which is that little tab on the back. We do the drip edge. But sometimes it's not necessary. If you have a little 10 foot section, um, this is one that we just wrapped up in North Avondale. Uh, we'll talk about somebody came through and cut these box cutters off. And they just had this roof redone. Uh, we just got off of it a month, month and a half ago. The amount of money that they spent on this would have been probably 10-15% less if there were box cutters on it. So that's something else to think of too, is future maintenance and stuff. They came through, they cut those off, and we'll look at a... Uh, and when I say we did the roof, I mean, all these tile, there's about 27,000 tile on that. We had to take all of them off and put them all back on. Now you can imagine dancing around on the roof. It's a lot easier if you have something solid, because three, four fully grown men can stand on a box cutter as part of the house framing. We couldn't do that with this, so we had to get aerialists, we had to fully scaffold it. So as the homeowner, and they didn't own this when the box cutters were cut off, as the homeowner, that person shot themselves in the foot when they tore these off, because it was significantly more. You know, it's not a $10,000 roof, guys. Um, Just the copper part? No, no. So we did, uh, yeah, the bay window and the front porch as well, but that's the uh, the roof that we did, the tile roof. Um, it was maybe 59 square or something like that. So it was a significant roof of one of the old, beautiful North Avondale houses. And um, that was the hard part without the last guy, which was taking it off, putting it around, because we got to get the tile around. It, it looks weird. It's, it's weird. It's tile. Is it slate? or? Oh, it's, yeah, sure. right there, right there. So that's a little bit better. Yeah, that's a fuzzy kind so of picture. Better. I don't know. Uh, just my JPEG or whatever those pictures are called. I don't think uploaded too well. But so that is a clay tile that is downstairs, actually. Um, oh, okay. I have one on a table down there you can take a look at. And it's, so a, it's clay made to sort of look like slate, maybe? Kind of, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a pretty common roofing system. Oh, okay. It has, like, troughs on the right-hand side, and they interlock. It's called a lightweight interlocking tile. Okay. And that's another thing that I want to have time to get into was um, for this uh, Covington Preservation School that is starting up as an awesome thing. Uh, Bobby App and I, we sat down, we were talking about a curriculum for box cutters, and uh, it was a good hour, hour and a half, something like that, and uh, he left my house, I was feeling good, and then I was like, wait, I totally forgot to mention box cutters tie into the roof. So we spent all this time talking about box cutters, because I could talk, you know, she knows, I could talk for uh, days and days and days and days about metal, box cutters, all this cool stuff. We totally forgot to talk about the roof. Well, if you don't tie into the box cutters with the roof the way that it was, whether it be slate, metal, tile, Again, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot because you're going to have a leaf there because you're not tying in properly. But uh, I'll get back to this. And that table downstairs, it has some separate roofing samples. You can see that box gutter. Um, you can kind of get you know, a template or whatever. You can just take a look at it. Um, get an idea. Come visit me down in the cafeteria after this. But uh, for this one, so that's that same house, the green tile, that they cut the box gutters off. This is the old flange off that box gutter. And what they did was they just cut it off, tucked one of those six inch gutters up behind it, and nailed it on. Well, there's the old metal, you know, from Lord knows, uh, let's say 1905, I want to say. What, what's the point? I mean, there, there are already holes in it and everything like that. So without painting that or maintaining it somehow, you've put the aluminum up against the steel or that old tin turn metal, which is going to react and it's going to deteriorate. Now, this beautiful brand new roof's there, and his next concern is going to be the gutters because that gutter apron's failing. All those gutters are leaking after 
25 years, I think they were installed, roughly about that. So you're, you're trading a system that lasted 100 years for you know a system that's now leaking. They're going to have to spend another amount. I want to say that it's probably a 25% of what new box cutters would be, something like that. But it's already failing, and now they have to spend it again. And it's going to be a lot more because it's got to tie into that roof that's just now done. So something to think of long term is just your specific roof. Like it always goes back to that. Every roof's different. Your specific roof. Know what you're dealing with. Know with you know the material, the spans, everything. Get it figured up. Every roof's a little different. But there we go again with the uh, flange where that apron is just tucked over top of this. They got to tear that off. You got to get a lift now to access the whole thing. When you could have worked out a box gutter to replace the box gutter, you can do that because they're structurally part of the house. They're sound. But uh, totally shot himself in the foot. And again, not that homeowner, <laughs> nicest guy in the world. Poor guy's got you know a little bit more to spend. Uh, this was one that we did right across the street, actually. Um, so this was again North Avondale area. Um, we did a whole pickup and tile relay on this, and it was factored in because there are box cutters on this. It was factored into the price. It was a little bit cheaper per square and everything because we were able to work out of the box cutter. It makes a huge difference. The reason this one's on here is because, first of all, they asked me to you know get on a plan to clean out the box cutters because not everybody out there is going to jump up on this thing. That's about a 60 foot span, something like that, and they're down. So it's not a 20 foot ladder that's going to get you up there. This is a fully extended 32 uh, on the top and like 24 at the bottom. So it's hard to get up there. The reason it's there, this picture, is because they had a small maintenance issue. It seemed like a big problem, but it's a maintenance issue. This little downspout right here just had one of those little guys in it, and it's totally clogged up. And strainers do help. I'm not a big fan of that strainer. It's like a you know, just metal one that you insert. Uh, we did not do the box cutters on this house, unfortunately. They were done before us about five, six years before, so we just did the roof. The box cutters on that house, I wasn't too happy with the um, opening. It was like a two inch opening, something like that, for the downspout. So when you do the new box cutter, one of the biggest most important parts is going to be good downspout. You, know? you, want, you want the water flow to make sense because the person that did this one, they probably got used to doing little porches. They probably had a bunch of little downspouts made up and they were like, yeah, slap one in there a little. That's not a 30-foot pour. I mean, that's a giant house, and all that water is coming into that, and it's going to get overwhelmed. So they just had water that was overflowing onto their driveway and in the back, and it was as simple as maintaining. Again, a bigger problem got avoided. You know, if water had sat up there and it was just constantly full of water and leaves and stuff, it would have rusted out sooner. But if you keep them clean, keep them painted, that's going to be a lifetime roof right there with the box cutters. Yeah, please. Why don't you make like humongous downspouts just because they don't look good? You want them to be visually small, you know? Because I mean, how is there too, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like um, and again, actually, on that table, I have a uh, collection box down there, and it's like a little tiny uh, resbon thing. What happened was the house was designed. You know, it was hilarious. <laughs> Architect uh, didn't think that one through, but way too much water was coming to one little spot. And instead of doing like an industrial. 12 inch Amazon warehouse, you know, downspout. We did a collection box and then uh, we were able to get the water sorted out. So it, it does, you know, make sense and it's all circumstantial. A uh, little porch, it just doesn't need it. I mean, if it's clean and everything, it's overkill. Um, we can put, you know, a three, a four inch downspout, something like that. And that's what you see a lot of times. You go to Lowe's and you're going to get a three by four inch rectangular downspout. Somebody's going to throw that up. That's an appropriate size, but I mean, be careful of using like the cheap downspouts because it'll split in the back. Like there's a seam that's there, and the manufacturer seam that always splits when ice and water gets in there. Uh, ice builds up and then splits it. That's one of the first things that goes. Uh, make sure that your downspout is also a good premium material, whether it be steel or what. You don't always need it to be soldered. Um, I mean, we, with copper downspouts and stuff, we'll, we'll sometimes do soldering and everything, fab it, and it'll be fine. But um, Sometimes it's just overkill, and that's what it comes down to. You don't need something <coughs> huge on your house if you don't need it there. It's just going to be more money. It's going to look a little weird, and it's just not necessary. And also, a lot of the times, especially around this area, it'll tie into a drain, and those drains go to the sewer lines or they go to the sanitation lines, the uh, water runoff, and those drains are going to be 
three inches, so you can't get a six inch one and it's just you know, overflow that. Um, this is just one that we're working on, actually, uh, one's out there Friday. This gutter, uh, it's funny, there are two sides of this house. One, they took the metal out, and the other, they didn't. Uh, and again, it all boils down to it's only as good as the craftsmanship and the amount of care and love that we put into these. Because they, they ripped one side out and they cut it out and everything to right, like the old under part that you see, and this side they didn't. But um, you can see the galvanic reaction started from the bottom and the top of these boss gutters, you've seen pictures. The tops look fine. They weren't in bad shape. Now they were done quick and they were done over top of the old stuff. It was sagging and everything, so it was time to correct the pitch, do it right. We cut into it. We found you know, multiple layers. You never want to go over. Always get it down to the bare wood. Uh, that way you can do the wood repair that you need. As you can see, that is green grass. You don't want that. You, know, you want solid wood. But the whole point of that picture is just to show you um, some guys don't care. Some guys might be hung over that day. Some guys might be arguing with their wives. Whatever it is, they didn't care. And they, in the next picture or two, you'll see, they left nails, they left all the debris, they left the whole liner in, and this was just one side. So they, they did you know, the right thing on half the house. Why they didn't tear it out on the other half, I don't know. They knew better, they just didn't care. But uh, just make sure that you know it's done right, what it boils down to. Otherwise, you're going to have the box cutter that looks shiny up top, rusting, corroding from the bottom up, because there's condensation that gets under there. And the bottom of it is going to start giving way, and then it starts getting brittle. Uh, just same thing, you know. Uh, pictures of the old metal in there. This was this old farmhouse out in Williamsburg we're doing right now, about 60 feet. And uh, this was one, too, that uh, I think I'll show you in a little bit. We're just nailing this one down. Um, it doesn't need to be that special engineered, because, I mean, box cutters are fairly simple. Um, not a whole lot goes into it, but there are the little tiny things that make it work, that make it better. This one's just nailed down, as you'll see, the majority of them are. Uh, here's a seam of uh, two pieces of Resabon. We stagger the rivets because that's going to give it a little bit of extra strength if you did have something start to happen, which is overkill on this because it's a little 14, 15 foot stretch. You're not going to have, you know, crazy stuff going on at 14 feet. But this is um, a seam that we riveted together. We'll clean it with acetone. Uh, we'll use a stay clean on this for the flux, make sure that the flux or the solder goes where it needs to go. Um, this is just a little end cap going up the uh, roof. Nothing too crazy, but uh, again, some of them are going to be direct end caps, some of them are going to go up. All circumstantial. So all, all of those are you like a soldering over the rivets or just the rivets? Yeah, yeah, and this one, like I said, I mean, this was, I think, Friday I took these pictures and I'll be back there Monday, Monday afternoon. This is before, you know, we soldered them up. Um, we usually don't nail down if it's you know, the big expanse. We do the clean system, but with the 14 foot, we just nail down. We solder everything all the way up, and then we're going to do ice guard, which you see back behind here. Which I have that little display down there. You'll see if you're not familiar, ice guard is not coating Kentucky. A lot of contractors get away with not using it because it's not coating Kentucky. It's funny, but it's not. It's a uh, made up in Frankfurt coat is, and I guess they don't get enough snow or ice to care. Well, up here. At old Newport, we have Cincinnati weather and we get ice. And every winter, I get you know phone calls here, there, I'm getting pulled all over because there are just ice stains, especially two, three years ago when we had the really bad storm. So, you want to make sure that even if it's not good, go above and beyond, use ice guard. Uh, this was just laid in there. Uh, we had to do the roof first just for the way this project went out. So, we cut that, tuck ice guard up under it, and we're good to go. Um, Here's the one picture I just wanted to show, a nail. I mean, they left a nail under there, and that is penetrating the bottom of it, and it was leaking everywhere, probably from day two or three. You get one guy up there, and it steps in the wrong spot, you now have it piercing through it, especially when it starts rotting out, and uh, once it starts rusting out, it's going to get weaker. It doesn't take a whole lot for it to puncture. So careful who you hire, make sure it's done right, you know, get the pictures, and just make sure that you know what's going on, because roofing, it takes a lot of integrity, you don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on if I use a sub or something like that. So that's why at this point in time, 
call me, I'm going to show up, I'm going to put a box cover on here in your house, and I'm going to make sure it's done right, because at the end of the day, you just don't know, and it's trust, and nothing's worse than that breach of trust, not knowing if it's done right. You want to talk to the guy doing it, you want to be in the loop, if anything pops up, it just helps to know. Uh, more of just the same thing, metal on the bottom, totally rusted out, metal here, the top looked great, the bottom's rusting out. And this is probably 10, 15 years old, I mean, who, who, who can tell, it's an old farmhouse out in Boonsburg, your guess is as good as mine, but it's not old metal. Um, definitely should have lasted, you know, 50 years or more, and it did not because of that uh, carelessness. Uh, just one last... Uh, probably one of the last projects on here. Um, and I'll take some questions, I know I'm probably coming up on timing. I'll take some questions at the end. This is one that was just uh, over in Hyde Park. <coughs> we had a huge seg in the box gutter. Uh, we have to set up, fully access. This is one that you're not gonna you know, work in while you're doing it because you gotta get everything out. You're gonna set up, fully access. This whole trough board, the whole sill, after years and years of ice and snow and everything, it's falling off. Going to cut everything off. You're going to get it out. This was one layer, luckily, and uh, tied into shingles. So some some roofs are going to tie into shingles. A lot of them are going to tie into metal or uh, slate tile, whatever. Uh, you want to rebuild it. Do it right. These there are a couple different ways that we'll do it. Um, if the rafters are there, the old rafters, sometimes you can use them. Sometimes they're still good. They're solid wood. If they're not rotted out, you can use them. Sometimes we use shims, or sometimes we'll do something like that to pitch it. Other times, if we have to rebuild it in this fashion, we just put new 2x4 sister two, three feet backed up against the brick, as far back as you can, new boards on there that I could stand on any one of those that are structurally part of the house now with you know, three-inch screws. Um, you do that down the hallway, you run a string from one end to the other, you make sure that it's pitched right, and then you just butt 2x4s up against it. That's one of the more economical ways to do it. Um, that's not me out there with like a planer, you know, taking an old true one by six and you know, doing a Amish thing. I'm not gonna do that unless you want me to. I'd love to, I love doing that, but you don't wanna pay for that. So, which, so the little two by fours that create mm -hmm. the pitch, what are they attached to? They are attached to that two by four that's attached to the house. Oh, I see. So they're screwed to that yes, with okay. two, three screws. Um, you, you wanna pre-drill, make sure it's not gonna split anything like that. And uh, that's going to be now the pitch. And you can stand on, you know, those two by fours as well. They're structural. At the end of this, you jump up and down with your friends. It's kind of weird. Don't do it, but you can if you want. In that box cutter, uh, I'll try to rush through. Uh, same thing. This is one that instead of that system, we notched out the actual two by fours, the uh, old boards. They were semi decent. Um, the rafters themselves, they weren't, you know, destroyed. So we. Nosh new wood, put it up alongside it, sistered it to it. Um, that was the fastest, easiest way to do that one that made the most sense. Again, every project is circumstantial. It's not a total rebuild. You don't have to go all out. This is uh, actually probably more difficult than the other thing happened. Nosh used two by four, but uh, every house is circumstantial. Uh, did some fancy trim on this one. This is a Columbia Custom Painted Lady. Anyone's familiar with that area? Um, on the wood, uh, we ended up using, majority of the time we'll just use pine. It's covered with metal, it's never going to leak because we solder it, if we do it right, it's not going to be exposed. Why not go the extra mile, we can give you options for whatever. These are primed one buys, it doesn't need to be primed one by, but it's a great idea. It doesn't matter because there still is condensation and if it's a copper roof or something like that where it's a lifetime, I would suggest doing something like this. If it's one that might be changed out in 50 years, well, you know, number two pine's going to work. It's fine. It's covered with the metal. Um, you're, you're not going to have to worry about it. But so the pine one by, I'm sorry, the yeah, pine yeah. one by is actually pine, but it's just primed. Correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a little bit higher grade. That's, you know, we didn't go to load with the high park lumber, go to supplier, get some nice prime wood. It's going to last a little bit longer. Circumstantial, depends on your project. Um, they didn't, you know, have the, uh, they didn't have the little trim decorative pieces uh, in pre primed wood, so you know, prime once it's up there, uh, paint it, and voila. But um, again, you have different variables and factors that can be changed up to make the system 
more economical, more makes sense for your situation. Um, <laughs> you guys are happy about that. Um, I think I'm just about at my limit. I work at about an hour, I've been at 45 minutes, and uh, I think I have to about 11.15. So um, usually there's somebody with a hook that will come and hit me and hand me off. Until then, questions? Uh, yeah, I just bought my house. I've never even heard of a box of mm -hmm. I bought that house. And uh, in the inspection report, it basically said, kind of looked at the box gutter and got to have them inspected every year. Okay? I and mean, that's all I know. <laughs> so, right. so my question is, what does, what does an annual inspection of box gutters really entail? And is that often yeah. enough? But what does that entail? Who does it? Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, I, I have a three-story. I prefer not to get on the ladder and go to check it all out. So That's understandable. How do we, I mean, if, if it needs an annual inspection, what does that mean and who does it? My politician answer is it's all circumstantial. Give me a call. <laughs> it is circumstantial. Uh, do you have a giant pine tree right over it? Do you have the little helicopters that, you know, hold stuff? Is it out in the middle of a field with absolutely nothing like Arizona? Like, it does matter uh, the material. Are they painted? Um, when were they last painted? And that's all stuff I don't know. Yeah. And I can come out. I can take a look at it. Uh, I love inspectors. I just joined InterNACHI looking at doing an inspection you know, company down the road. They're, they're great people. They're generalists. They don't know everything about box gutters. It's, it's, I deal with too many inspection reports, and it's always call a qualified contractor. Call a qualified contractor. Well, call me. I'd love to come out, just take a look at it. I do free estimates. Um, if it needs it, we do a annual leaf cleaning. I mean, some people we do, you know, spring, summer, or spring and fall. You really don't need to get up there every month and throw a party. Um, it's not needed. If you have a giant tree over top of it, it's more important. Um, at that point in time, does it make sense to trim the tree back a little bit? Because you probably got squirrels and all sorts of other stuff destroying your stuff up there. But um, it really all depends. Because if it's a copper box gutter, once every five years is fine. If there's not a lot of stuff up there, put a strainer in it. Don't worry about it. If it's pitched right and everything like that. If it's not pitched right, you'll know because it'll be overflowing in your driveway. And call me. Um, all my answers are going to go back to call me. But uh, yeah, I've got cars down there too. You guys get my number, um, and you know I come out. But it really just depends on the material used, if it's pitched right, and how many big trees you have around. Because I'd love to sign you up for my annual inspection program. I can come out semi-annually if it's really needed, but it's not. A typical box gutter painted once every other year might be fine if you don't see things falling over. If you see water pouring over in other spots, that means it's clogged up. You know, maybe switch out your drain uh, pipe, your downspouts and stuff, but just give me a call. What to paint it with? Depends on what it has been painted with. Um, Sometimes, if it's pretty clean metal and it's in good shape, I would recommend just doing, like, I believe Coronado is a very good paint that, uh, C-O-R-O, -O, yeah, I've never had to spell it out loud in front of a crowd. Um, Coronado, and it's a pretty good premium metal paint for exterior application. Um, one other thing that we go with that is being pushed on a lot of people by the supplier, because it's a good product, it's a GE product, it comes from men much smarter than I, um, engineered to last is GE silicone, it's called Enduris, E-N-D-U-R-I-S, and it's a silicone product, one step higher than paint, you want to make sure that your box cutters are in good shape, that they're a good candidate to do that. Because if it's falling down and you just slap that on it, it's not going to work. Um, the only warranty issues I've really ever had are from coating. Um, and that's because we coated something, painters came after us, painted the house. Well, what did they do? So on porch, they put ladders and stuff on this porch and scraped it up a little bit. And once the water penetrates it, it's done. It's going to get anywhere. So you want to make sure that... The metal's clean, pressure washed, done right, and then you can coat it with like a silicone or something like that. I would recommend doing the Endura silicone, but if it's visual, like if it's at the very front of the house and like it's a metal roof or something like that, I 
probably would say Coronado, like a paint, because the silicone is silicone. It, it's a little bit shiny. Right? We can get you samples of it, um, I, and we we can coat and we can paint box cutters too. Uh, believe believe it or not, you know. Um, so just give me a call and I can take a look at it. Just make sure it's done right, cleaned out, pressure washed. Let the water dry. You don't want to put it on wet because it's silicone that will react with water. It has to be 100% dry and clean, or it will not go down right. Um, but again, cork and steel, C-O-R-K-E-N, cork and steel in Covington. A lot of you are probably familiar with them. That's the place to go if you have questions about material. Contractors can point you in the right direction, but cork and steel and friendly staff down there. I can do an infomercial real quick, make some money. Uh, they can help you out, get the right stuff, and point you towards all your options. And again, it boils down to every house is circumstantial. So there are multiple ways to do it. Yes. Um, I have a story Okay. Yeah. And I have a huge maple tree with the helicopters right next. Mm. One of those guys. And I can tell that in the corner the water is coming down. I don't know if it needs cleaning. I always get these gutter uh, boy calling me all the time. Do you want your gutter please? How often do I need that done? Should I get an inspection? No, I need it. But the unknown is what keeps me up. My lawyer advised me not to name drop any actual companies, but no. um, stuff like that's fine. These annual programs, the clean gutters and everything, they're totally fine. But have somebody that knows box gutters come out first because what could be, let me come out every six months to clean it, could be fixed by those strainers, by the downspout being the right size, by, you know, just your... Let's make sure that the box cutter is functioning the way that it should be first. And then it might be instead of every six months, once every other year or once every year for a tree like that. I mean, those are kind of pains in the butt, but it depends on a couple things. Um, the trough, like right here, how deep this is, this is a very shallow one. If it's a little bit thicker and it's painted or if it's copper, if it's done right, it doesn't matter if it holds a little bit of water at the downspout. It can do that. And if there's a strainer in it, that's going to make it hold water at the downspout because it's going to collect the debris and it's going to build up right there a little bit. If you have a little bit of water, it's okay. If you have a lot of water, then you have an issue, so it's going to pour over. If you have, you know, like a two-inch lip, that's going to hide it better than if you have a one-inch lip. If you have a one-inch lip, it's going to pour over. So, again, it's kind of just circumstantial. The best thing to do, have somebody come out, take pictures. Drones are really cool. They're great. But guess what? With a drone, you don't know if it's two layers of, you know, roof that's on top. You don't know if the metal is solid. You might be able to see if you're in person up on the box gutter, if it's two layers of metal, because if it's two layers of metal, automatic red flag. Drones work for stuff like that, and you can get inspections, your home inspection, like that's great. Best thing to do is just ladder, person up in the box gutter, point out deficiencies, point out what it is, no I mean, it, it's worth, you know, knowing what you're dealing with and just having that peace of mind because otherwise you're just going to be like, oh, is that right? Like, who knows? You know, it's not. Right. That little elbow. Yeah, and that can collect stuff if you don't have a strainer. Right. Yeah, and if you don't have a strainer, it could all back up those little, like, oak leaves, whatever they are, uh, the helicopters, they could back up in that elbow, and that's going to make it ten times more difficult because it's three stories up, and it's not like I can reach down and grab that. i got to set the ladder up, take off the elbows, clean them out. If you have a strainer, that prevents a lot of it. So you have a couple of, you know, red flags. If you see water coming down like that, call me. If you see rotten wood or something like that, and a lot of the times rotten wood's going to be around the downspout because the gutter might be painted and maintained, but the drop tube... Um, the part, you know, goes through the gutter and it connects from the gutter to the downspout. That might be 35, 40 years old. You can't paint that. It's two inches. It might be three inches. I don't care who you are. You're not going to get a paintbrush in there and paint that. So that's the first thing that always rusts out. And that is something that you'll see rotten wood on the saw pit, which is that under part. You'll see that pretty much as a telltale sign. That's when you know you have a problem. So between water overflowing in a spot that it shouldn't, 
water coming over top of the downspout, something like that, or sometimes it shoots out from the downspout if it's clogged up. Um, just red flags like that or rotten wood in the saw, but those are the big, big things. Did you have one? I have a metal roof. Okay. Um, if I were to replace the box cars, would I have to replace the entire roof system? Wonderful question. Circumstantial. <laughs> Call me, I'll take a look at it. Usually you do not have to, depending on how that is tied in, because the majority of those metal systems are gonna be a single fold panel system where the box gutter comes up and it holds hands with the roof and it's smashed down and you might be able to undo that seam, tuck one up underneath and re-smash it. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna take a little bit of TLC to get it tied in correctly. If it's not totally disintegrated, something like that, you can. Worst case scenario, you can cut the back flange. So this is, this is going up your roof right here. This is gonna fold over and it's gonna have the roof hold hand with it. You could cut that flange if the roof is not in bad shape. If it's in bad shape, if it needs to be replaced, you're shooting yourself in the foot, you're gonna have to deal with the roof after the box cutter. You can cut that, you can tuck a box cutter underneath of it, and you can fasten that down. There are multiple ways to do it. Um, and it depends on the decorative, like if it's a normal standing seam, that's a lot easier. There are a couple uh, stamped tin roofs that we're looking at doing. The normal stuff. Yeah, yeah. Give me a call. It, it can be done as long as the roof's in good shape. And then my box cutter has some kind of like decorative additional layer of metal. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, sometimes they're cornices that are metal, which is like that like crown molding look. And sometimes they have corbels, which are like the big decorative pillar looking things underneath. Um, a lot, you know, can go into it. Sometimes they're metal, sometimes they're wood. If they're wood, you'll see them rotten out if there's a problem. If they're metal, they can hide a lot of issues because you're not going to see rotten wood. They might be rusting on the backside, and usually by the time you know, it's too late because they're totally rusted out. But, um, yeah, it's possible to replace box gutters if it's a metal roof. So there's no, so no worries there. Just following on from that, you were going to replace an existing roof, say it's a shingle roof, Put a metal roof on. Okay. Do metal roof contractors know what they're doing with the box cutter? There was one time that I was down in Maysville, and I did that, and the gutter worked great, and the roof worked great, and the roofing contractor did his thing, and I did mine. But it leaked right where they hold hands because they did not push them together. They just laid it over top, and they just didn't fold their metal seam panels, right, and they collected water there, and it ended up leaking on the outside of the fascia, like, uh, kind of came through back where, you know, the soffit meets the fascia, and you can see water drips. Um, met out there, did our little powwow, I'll fight. Awesome. <laughs> and we figured out it was something where the metal contractor didn't tie it in right, once it was tied in right, once they caulked their seams and everything on their roof, it worked great. So a lot of the times, and we do roofs too, but wait, there's more. 10% <laughs> uh, off if you call it a day. Um, I will at least work directly with a contractor if they're going to touch my box cutter. If they touch my box cutter, your warranty's over with me. Because they're going to nail all through here. And if it's one of those systems with the expansion joint, they just screwed up all that work that you paid for because it's more money to do an expansion joint. Plus, they screwed up the whole system because now it can't move freely and there's stress on the seams, yada, yada, yada. You don't do that. That's why you cleat and you don't nail in the metal if it's a long seam like that. If it's a 10 foot section, it's okay. You can nail in it, but you don't want to nail down low. You want to nail it right. If you're going to have a contractor work on one part and not the other, make sure that the contractors work together. I'm sick and tired of doing coatings and I'm sick and tired of working with people. I don't play well with others anymore <laughs> because there's always some thing that's going to get lost in translation unless the contractors are working together. So. I hope they, uh, that answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> Call me. Is there a kind of roof that works best with box Not really. Um, it's a universal system that can adapt to anything, and that's just what it's all about. It's just making sure that your system makes sense. If it's the you know long stretch, if it ties into shingles, if it ties into slate, you want to make sure. Um, if there's slate, you don't need any underlayment. I mean, historically, you don't. Um, if it's a tile roof, you want to make sure you're using like a high temp Carlisle Whip 300. It's like a water nice protection, fancy stuff. Um, 
all just going to boil down to what your system is, how big it is, because the water flow, the volume is going to be a factor. You have just a lot of stuff that's going to kind of tie in, but a box gutter can work with any roof system. Anything else? Fiance's already telling me what to do. All right. Any other questions? I'm in the cafeteria. Come and find me, guys. I really appreciate it.